Bien, bonjour à tous, merci d'être venus si nombreux pour cette première séance de dimanche matin à 8h pour le compte rendu des ateliers. Et j'ai le privilège de, de présenter l'atelier numéro 1. Et let me shift to, to English. Uh, I have the privilege to be the rapporteur of uh, the uh, group on uh, the workshop on uh, finance and economics uh, under the chairmanship of Jean-Claude uh, Trichet. So in, in a similar workshop last year at the WPC, we had noted nine points of attention which, in retrospect, we found quite prescient. We had notably observed that even with the comfort of careful central bank policies, inflation prospects remained uncertain. And our jury had been out on whether the observed inflation surge at the time was transitory or would transform into sustained overheating. One year later, we have clearly moved to a regime of high inflation. This regime has been engineered as of last year by a combination of demand push through the fiscal expansions designed to alleviate the short-term cost of the pandemics and of a supply shock through disorganized supply chains and logistical hurdles. The war in Ukraine created another inflationary supply shock with dramatically higher prices of energy and food products. Our debate this year has pointed to some differences between the United States and Europe, with the demand component of the inflationary shock more potent in the United States, while in Europe, inflation seems more supply-driven, notably given Europe's dependency to Russia, Russian energy. It was observed that monetary policy is a poor instrument to react to supply-driven inflationary shocks because it does not act on supply, but can only restrain demand to adjust to the new supply equation. However, the reaction to this surge of inflation has consisted of a very significant, if a bit delayed, tightening of central bank policies, with the difference in nature of inflation between the US and Europe, justifying a more restrained reaction so far of the European Central Bank. Nonetheless, the core inflation in the US and Europe now seems remarkably similar. Two issues remained uncertain in our debate. One, we can expect post-COVID supply chains to work better, thus alleviating over time some of the supply chain constraints. How much this will contribute to reducing inflationary pressures remains to be seen. And second, the question is whether we are already or not witnessing a wage price spiral. Some participants argued that this has started to be the case, notably in the United States, or that it is coming soon. Others observed that wages had increased so far much less than the inflation. So the, the debate is still open on that ground. Clearly, however, the party is over. And we need to understand and adjust, and adjust to the implication of substantially higher interest rates. Our debate covered the following issues. First, monetary policy dilemmas. Central banks face a tough trade-off. If they tighten too much, they will plunge the economies into a recession that could be unduly severe. If they don't tighten enough, that might lead to infl inflation out of the battle with the risk of having to increase interest rates much more later on to correct for insufficient action. The group was overall rather convinced that central banks had acted so far with caution, wisdom, and adequate determination. Second, growth prospects. In that new context, everyone seemed to agree that 2023 would be characterized by a slowdown in growth and possibly by recession. Fiscal policies were seen as largely inoperant given the size of budget deficits and of public debts. There had been an extraordinary situation, now over, during which governments could accumulate debt and simultaneously see the debt service ratio actually decrease given the very low interest rates. The rise in interest rates left now governments without much margin of maneuver to sustain investment or compensate the poorer segments of the populations likely to suffer most from high interest rates and inflation. That led the group to note the political risk and the fragility of the social contracts, and these were mentioned as major concerns, 
with an open question of how to engineer the kind of social contract that would be conducive to a green transition, it was also mentioned that growth of GDP was not an adequate objective per se, consistent with the preoccupation regarding climate change and the green economy, nor with the preoccupation regarding social inclusion and distributional concerns, which are not included in the metrics of GDP. Third, financial market volatility. Participants noted the nervousness of financial markets where portfolio reallocations take place and assets are driven back now to more realistic values. Bubbles will explode. This is a high-risk situation, which is mitigated by the fact that banks in developed countries are much better capitalized now than they were in earlier crisis episodes, and by the role of the Financial Stability Board and the decisions taken so far by G20 countries since the Lehman bankruptcy. It was also mentioned that the weaponization of finance through the resort to sanctions against an economy of the size of Russia had implications on the assessment of risks and on risk aversion and could affect the possibility to meet the extraordinary demands for finance generated notably by the needs of the green transition. Fourth, ESG in the same spirit, how to allocate capital to green transition and social objectives, should we rely on autonomous private decisions driven by ESG concerns? Our debate was inconclusive, but participants insisted on the need for transparency and clarity and on the ultimate role of governments in providing proper regulation and taxation to support the transition. Fifth, period of strong dollar driven by the interest rate differential in favor of the US and by the exposure of Europe to the energy and war shock and again by the safe haven effect following the return of war in Europe. This is fueling inflation outside of the United States through imported inflation, notably in Europe and in developing countries where it can also generate credit failures. The discussion about the dollar also included questions regarding the prospects for the dollar as an international reserve currency. Sanctions could notably affect the perceived safety of holding reserve assets in dollars and in euros and could create incentives to diversify reserve assets. However, it was mentioned that the dollar could be expected to remain the major world international currency for the foreseeable future, though no date was given to define what this foreseeable future could be, notably given the lack of alternatives to the dollar as a reserve asset. Six, the situation of emerging and developing countries, which was mentioned as a source of utmost concern. There, they have been subject to capital flight, linked to reassessment of risk, increased risk aversion, changes in interest rates and exchange rates, portfolio reallocations, leaving them with a lot of difficulties to refinance themselves. Their debt situation is ominous. To the difference of developed countries, their debt service had already deteriorated, and this is now compounded by much higher interest rates. How to manage that situation? especially in the context of substantial investment needs, was mentioned as a crucial challenge that should lead to strengthening the tier one capital of development finance institutions to allow to bear first losses. In the face of the likelihood of a series of debt crises, the framework to manage this crisis is not in place. Given the rise of new creditors, including China, the Paris Club is no longer an effective coordination forum. The G20 has established a new common framework whose implementation, however, has been uh, disappointingly sluggish. Coordination across donors, both public and private, and with the, 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 the aim to avoid to coordinate only among the public uh, actors and then to impose a solution on the private creditors, was thought as an urgent challenge in need for prompt actions and decisions. We also discussed whether central banks should provide swap lines to ease the financial situations of emerging countries. The debate highlighted the risk of confusion and lack of coordination between, on the one hand, IMF facilities and, on the second hand, central bank provided facilities, and a preference to rely on the IMF financing facilities seems to have emerged from our discussions. Last but not least, 
food security, which will be addressed later in one of the sessions in this WPC, was mentioned as a crucial challenge in developing countries, which are confronted to a host of simultaneous crises, economic, food, political, security, geopolitical, energy, climate, and so on. Thank you very much, and I, I'm, I'm sure that my colleagues and our chairman, uh, who were uh, present in the discussion yesterday, can complement what I just said. Thank you very much. Um, let me continue on energy and climate issues, which we discussed uh, in a panel that was uh, moderated by uh, Valérie Ducrot from the uh, Global Gas Centre, who is here in the room and uh, who, who may, of course, then be available as well for, for further comments. I think the, we, we first uh, enjoyed a very sobering, uh, factual uh, presentation on the fact that geopolitics are back big time affecting energy markets and policies and and yet with the disconnect because that needs to be fully incorporated actually into policies especially uh, in uh, net importing countries in Europe and and is not yet the case and and so geopolitics matter in, especially in oil and gas as you may imagine, but also increasingly in industrial value chains. And they matter because there is an uneven, uh, an uneven uh, split of resources and reserves globally, of course, of oil and gas. But if we mention oil, we have about almost three of the world's largest or some of the largest resource holding countries on the sanctions. And, and, and that is, of course, uh, an unprecedented situation with uh, Russia, Iran, and, and Venezuela. Although Venezuela, there is some latest developments uh, to be followed. But but the point is, this leads to volatility. This should trigger uh, policies that uh, you know can 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 ensure resilience. And um, and this uh, also points to a mismatch between the falling investments, for example, in the upstream oil and gas that we've seen, and the fact that demand, instead of falling and, and following that trend, has actually been continuing to increase. So there is an obvious problem here, and we are going to face this problem uh, for, for, for the next years. And so do not expect any fall in prices, and actually expect quite the contrary, or at least a lot of more volatility. And um, and so there is an obvious investment challenge on the fossil fuel side, but of course there is a major investment challenge on the renewable side. And, and we noted, of course, that uh, the uh, investment allocated to renewables is uh, increasing year by year and, and is making spectacular progress, but uh, let's not uh, be uh, complacent, this is still way below what is needed to put us on track for a 1.5 degrees trajectory. We then, I think, had a very interesting uh, conversation on global governance, uh, global energy governance and global energy and climate governance, actually, um, which uh, highlighted, indeed, some of the uh, tensions that are out there between the so-called global north and global south. Indeed, there is, uh, uh, there is elements uh, of uh, double standards that have been identified. We have um, also uh, discussed some imbalances created by Russia's war in Ukraine and some of the fundamental systemic imbalances in markets, namely, for example, that uh, uh, a large part of the spot LNG market has been siphoned off by the Europeans at the expense of uh, several emerging economies, which uh, I should stress uh, is in no way violating any contractual obligations, but it's just uh, uh, translating a reality where even in a world governed by contracts, you still have the market aspect uh, that translates into, well, the ones that's ready to pay the most gets it at, at the end, right? And gets the cargoes and the volumes at the end. So obviously, uh, this, was, uh, this was part of the discussion. Another point that was raised was the issue of how do we democratize 
global energy and climate governments. There was this view expressed that uh, this governance is imbalanced towards the north and that, you know, some of the leading institutions are based in the north, uh, uh, you know, uh, driven by the OECD notably or the IEA. Um, and and that obviously that there's a need for a rebalance there. And, and, and actually we agreed, uh, or at least it was a consensus to say that, well, that needs to be somehow democratized and, and that we need more dialogue among all the, all the stakeholders. And there was a, an idea to set up a, a, an, an energy security council uh, which was uh, raised, which is quite interesting. Um, although, if you start thinking in practical terms, um, you immediately, of course, uh, come up with a number of uh, questions and issues. But, but still, I think uh, you know, with rising India and 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 rising Indonesia, etc., this uh, this definitely deserves to be uh, to be looked at uh, in future. Um, nonetheless, of course, it was pointed out that we still have or already have, I should say, uh, global uh, institutions such as, uh, or, or, or forums such as, of course, COP, and uh, which actually brings together the North and the South. And, um, and, and of course, so we are not here in the desert, right, uh, totally. So there's still, a, um, there's already uh, something in place, but uh, work can be further done on, on, on complementing that. Um, then we, we moved on to discuss, uh, of course, the, the many environmental and climate urgencies. And, and needless to say, there was a reminder that we are in a race against time. We are in a race against ourselves, uh, that we are not on track. But some interesting perspectives for, for all of you who may not all be energy and climate experts, but it was reminded that it's not just about CO2. It's not actually about only greenhouse gas emissions altogether, but it's equally uh, about greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity, and that the one cannot deliver without the other. So these are the, the two hands um, which we are to work on. It was reminded that we just have COP15 in, in Montreal, which of course attracts much less attention, regrettably, than a COP27 or, or the forthcoming COP28. Another important element uh, brought into the discussion was that we should not overfocus on supply side issues and supply side solutions. And of course, there will be a lot of new technologies coming, and we've seen incredible progress there over the past years. But we should really focus much more on demand side solutions and technologies as well, especially in electricity systems. And there was a point made that, well, electricity systems will be increasingly decentralized. And of course, not everywhere. And that has different meanings, where, depending on where you are. But you know, also the thinking of you know, everything being central and, and the way electricity systems were established in past years, or in past, I should say, past uh, 50 or 60 years, obviously we'll see changes there. So one has to think about you know, flexibility on the supply and demand side, um, when also uh, you know, uh, the transformation is about electrifying systems, but saying that should not, you know, set aside that a lot of the focus should be on producing heat. And uh, and so you can produce heat for various forms. Nuclear was mentioned as a, as a fundamental solution for that. And then <coughs> we mentioned two of the issues that popped up in Europe recently, but still have to make their way across the world, which is uh, energy sobriety, so that's obviously something uh, for uh, developed economies. I mean, if you have uh, nothing or almost nothing, uh, it's, it's ridiculous to speak about it. But nonetheless, we see a lot of uh, emerging economies that, uh, that uh, have also room to, to improve that. A focus on circularity, reuse, reinject. Um, a major stumbling block, which is still to be addressed, which is how do you store electricity in the longer term? And, and that is something for, for everyone to, 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 to focus on, and especially a, a new avenue uh, for, for R&D efforts. And then, and then of course, uh, it was reminded that we still have a lot of work to fix uh, the inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, as is the wording in official uh, governance declarations. And that obviously here, uh, we still have a lot of work to do, both in the north and the south, and that, of course, the directions taken uh, with the crisis uh, is not uh, is not really, um, of course, uh, uh, wishful. 
Voilà, uh, a last uh, point, uh, and I'll end here, um, regarding the different uh, countries and geographies. I think we, we also touched up in Russia, and uh, and it was, there was an interesting perspective, I think, for, for everyone to, to have in mind, thinking about uh, the future after the war, which is that maybe there is a possibility that indeed uh, a new post-war Russia uh, might be uh, actually might rise uh, based on uh, a, a, a commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to decarbonize the, the Russian economy and and it was uh, mentioned that you know the younger part of the youngest generation in Russia is extremely interested in these topics so I think that's uh, you know some hope at the end of uh, and some light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, happy to pass the floor to my colleague. Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour. Euh, J'ai eu l'honneur de présider l'atelier 3 qui a été entièrement consacré à l'Afrique. Nous avons entendu à ce, dans cet atelier euh, des exposés introductifs de moi-même, de M. Antille, de M. Tchèque-Tidian Gallio, de Mesdames Elisabeth Guigou, Aminata Touré, Juliette Toakli et de M. Lionel Zissou. Suite à ces exposés introductifs, il y a M. Narayana, ancien conseiller technique du Premier ministre de l'Inde, qui nous a fait un exposé sur l'existence de la Fondation économique Afrique-Inde pour promouvoir l'investissement. Ensuite de cela, il y a eu des débats. Alors, de tous les exposés et des débats qui s'en sont suivis, nous retenons à peu près ce qui suit. D'abord, les participants à l'atelier se sont félicités de ce qu'il y a eu cette année à la World Policy Conference, euh, un, une table ronde en séance plénière consacrée à l'Afrique. Nous avons essayé d'approfondir des éléments qui ont été exposés à cette table ronde, on a essayé de les approfondir en atelier. La première chose que nous avons soulignée est que dès la proclamation des indépendances sur le continent africain dans les années 1960, un peu avant ou un peu après, les nouveaux États se sont trouvés confrontés à un double défi à relever celui de construire un État-nation, parce que tous, la plupart des États, presque tous, ont hérité d'une administration coloniale dont le territoire provient de la conférence de Berlin. Alors, il faut construire un État-nation euh, et, d'une deuxième part, construire un développement socio-économique, et ce qui, à la date d'aujourd'hui, n'est pas réalisé. Des progrès ont été relevés, mais il y a de nombreuses contraintes et des dysfonctionnements dans la gouvernance qui ont également été euh, soulignés par les euh, panélistes et, les, de, de, et ceux qui ont participé à cet atelier. À un point tel qu'au jour d'aujourd'hui, l'Afrique est devenue certes une terre d'espérance, mais... C'est la terre de prédilection du terrorisme et particulièrement dans le Sahel. Nous nous sommes un peu apesantis sur ce terrorisme et il nous est apparu que le terrorisme d'aujourd'hui n'a plus réellement un caractère religieux et que le terrorisme d'aujourd'hui prend appui sur les problèmes internes de chacune de nos nations. Et si l'on examine la situation, par exemple au Burkina Faso, 80% de ceux qui sont considérés aujourd'hui comme terroristes sont des nationaux. Et ces 80% eh bien, sont dans une situation de précarité et de révolte réelle qui les rend aptes à se faire recruter par n'importe qui 
et pour n'importe quel motif, parce que l'espérance a disparu à leur niveau. Voilà les facteurs internes qui proviennent de cette précarité de vie de la jeunesse. Cette jeunesse est en proportion énorme aujourd'hui sur le continent africain. C'est un continent jeune. Certes, des progrès ont été faits de telle sorte que le, le taux de, 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 de mortalité a diminué, a reculé énormément grâce au progrès de, de, dans le domaine de la santé, dans le domaine de l'éducation. Et la population demeure quand même plus de 50% une population jeune. C'est un facteur de développement. Mais l'agencement des structures internes, de, tant au niveau de la gouvernance, euh, n'a pas permis le progrès escompté. Il faut ajouter à cela des facteurs externes. Les facteurs externes qui ont pris au départ l'apparence de religiosité et puis qui se sont transformés dans un trafic international, euh, tant au plan des armes qu'au plan de trafic de tous ordres. L'Afrique est devenue un terrain de refuge de toutes les mafias du monde. Et, et le, le drame est que on constate que certains terroristes sont mieux armés que les armées des États. Et à cela s'ajoute un autre danger, le, le mercenariat qui a pénétré le territoire. Quand on parle des de Wagner ici et là, euh, l'année dernière, nous l'avons souligné rapidement dans l'atelier, euh, nous nous maintenons que c'est un, un mercenariat, parce qu'il n'appartient à aucune armée officielle. Or, tous les États africains ont ratifié la convention de l'Organisation de l'Unité africaine sur le mercenariat, et certains États utilisant Wagner ont ratifié également la Convention des Nations Unies sur la même question. C'est des conventions qui ont incriminé, incriminé le mercenariat. Mais personne n'en dit rien, aucun officiel n'a soulevé cette question. J'ai lu récemment un, un excellent article d'un juriste sur la question, mais c'est tout, c'est tout, c'est tout. Le chômage des jeunes a des liaisons également avec la question foncière. Dans les campagnes, ils n'ont pas, dans certains de nos États, accès au foncier. Et le foncier, au plan général, n'est nulle part stabilisé encore. Or, nous savons que le foncier est une donnée pour attirer aussi l'investissement, parce que personne n'investit dans les nuages en haut, on investit sur le sol. Alors, nous constatons également, il a été relevé dans l'atelier, que les jeunes couvrent de nombreux contentieux. De nombreux contentieux. Et certains observateurs ont estimé que la jeunesse du continent africain est un peu comme un volcan qui attend le moment approprié pour rentrer en éruption. On en a eu des signes, euh, au Burkina Faso, à Dakar, Balais citoyen, euh, c'est des indices qui sont assez éloquents euh, pour ça. Nous estimons que, nous avons estimé que tant que ces contentieux qui couvrent chez les jeunes ne sont pas réglés, vidés, eh bien, le danger du terrorisme euh, va perdurer. Et pour ça, non seulement la question foncière, mais il faut nécessairement qu'il y ait une justice saine, équitable, accessible à tous, ce qui n'est pas souvent le cas dans nos, sur ce continent. Et la, la solution est qu'il faut massivement investir sur le, les jeunes, dans la formation, dans le débouché, mais il faut également investir sur les femmes. C'est un double, double donné et absolument important. Mais pour investir sur les jeunes pour, et sur les femmes, eh bien, il faut des capitaux. 
Et il faut nécessairement des garanties de l'investissement pour pouvoir orienter les investissements vers le continent africain. Et c'est en cela que la promotion du secteur privé, la promotion du secteur privé sur le continent est, a été soulignée comme une, une nécessité. Et l'analyse nous a conduit à déplorer ce que l'un des panélistes, l'un des, des, des partisans à l'atelier a appelé la captation de l'État par des dirigeants et que certains autres ont appelé la, la tendance patrimoniale du pouvoir d'État. Euh, ce qui conduit à tous ces dysfonctionnements qui, sont, qui génèrent des putschs, des coups d'État en, en tout genre. Rien que dans l'Afrique de l'Ouest, euh, les mois passés, il y a eu trois putschs, euh, dont un a été putsch, putsch dans putsch, un putsch double, qui, euh, et on donne, on a, les, 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 les militaires qui ont pris le pouvoir donnent l'impression de, de s'éterniser, de ne pas vouloir sortir de, du putsch et de la transition, alors que, alors que des instruments de la CEDAO, des instruments de l'Organisation de l'Unité africaine, je veux parler au niveau de la CEDAO, des deux protocoles sur la gouvernance, la paix, etc., et les élections, je veux parler de la charte africaine, euh, sur les élections et la gouvernance et qui ont rendu illégaux les putschs. Et malgré cela, les putschs durent encore et perdurent. Les communautés économiques régionales africaines, comme la CDAO et autres, ont, face à ces situations, euh, fait ce qu'elles ont pu faire. Et néanmoins, certains ont estimé que la CDAO, par exemple, a épuisé euh, ses capacités, euh, je ne crois pas. Nous n'avons la tendance dominante, euh, n'y croit pas. La... Nous pensons également que, outre la question de... du foncier, il y a une question essentielle concernant, le... concernant la production de l'électricité qui qui retarde la, la production agricole et la transformation des produits agricoles sur place. Euh, il a été souligné que nous ne pouvons plus être euh, exclusivement euh, producteurs de matières premières pour euh, les uns et les autres, et que les transformations sur place doivent se faire. Le chocolat, on le produit, mais c'est d'autres qui vont transformer et on vient nous les revendre. Euh, C'est une prise de conscience qui a commencé. En Côte d'Ivoire, par exemple, ils ont commencé à fabriquer un peu le chocolat sur place, mais il nous faut des capitaux. Donc, nous revenons à la même, à la même question de capitaux. Et, et, et cette question nous amène à, au partenariat. Au partenariat avec l'Europe, mais au partenariat... Euh, avec d'autres au plan bilatéral et au partenariat au plan multilatéral. Je crois que nous avons euh, pensé, en tout cas, qu'une remise en cause, une meilleure coordination de la part des bénéficiaires de... de je ne parle pas des aides, je, passe, je vais employer une expression de, de flux financier à drainer par plusieurs canaux des pays qui sont riches vers les pays qui ne le sont pas. Les flux financiers sont de plusieurs ordres. Il y a rien qu'au niveau de la diaspora des facilitations pour que ceux de la diaspora, on appelle la diaspora des Africains qui ont émigrés ailleurs, qui ont réussi ailleurs, euh, soit par le travail salarié, soit par l'initiative privée, et qui, euh, attachés à leur terroir, envoient de l'argent euh, dans leur pays. Ensuite, il y a des non-Africains et des Africains qui ont réussi hors du continent africain 
et qui doivent venir pour investir dans leur pays sur le continent africain. Si la gouvernance ambiante n'est pas propice, et ils ne seront pas attirés. Donc ce sont là des, des questions qui sont récurrentes. Ce sont là des questions dont nous estimons que les gouvernants de ces pays doivent nécessairement se saisir. Et nous terminons par le, le changement, les questions posées par le changement climatique. Les, rapp les rapporteurs qui m'ont précédé ont évoqué la question et des, des, des COP, les différents COP ont proposé, euh, ont décidé euh, d'un certain apport financier parce que l'Afrique est le continent qui, qui pollue le moins, mais qui subit la grande conséquence, les grandes conséquences de la pollution. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pour que les décisions prises par les différentes, les différentes COP puissent avoir des faits Je crois que c'est une question à laquelle euh, la, les réponses ne sont pas encore trouvées, mais que nous avons besoin d'approfondir. J'arrête mon, mon rapport là. S'il y a des, des gens qui veulent compléter... Merci. Je crois qu'on peut. Non. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Bon, on a fini, non? Moi, ça...